to this year's Title Bomb Law Review Symposium. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner, and I have the honor and privilege of being the Dean at the SJ Quinney College of Law. My pronouns are she and hers. And as I like to do at the start of our events here at the SJ Quinney College of Law, I do want to share our University of Utah Tribal Land Acknowledgement Statement. I recognize that we're from all over the country this morning, but at least where I am physically located today, it's on the outer edge of the Goshute Territory which is where the University of Utah is. And so I think it's really important and impactful to acknowledge this land that the University of Utah is on. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Um, and it's really my privilege uh, to be able to start off this important conversation. I applaud the Law Review for its support of this discussion as one of our missions as the flagship institution of, at, of Utah is to to promote and embrace our roles as public intellectuals. So it's really exciting to be able to be with you, to have these robust and uh, timely conversations. I'm particularly appreciative that the Law Review has decided to host um, this year's conference on the topic of law and ethics and medical research, as it could not be a more timely and important topic. We've seen this issue of medical research coming up again and again in the news recently, especially in relationship to the COVID-19 vaccine, the trials related to that vaccine development and its efficacy. So I'm very pleased that this will be the focus of our conversation. And I'm also incredibly excited to welcome world-class speakers from around the country who are gonna be joining us both today and next week to engage on this important conversation. I want to thank them and acknowledge them. And I'm very appreciative for their time that they're giving us today. I also want to thank the many wonderful people who have put so much time and effort into uh, making this conference a reality. So first I'd like to acknowledge Tammy Frisbee, who is the symposium editor for the Utah Law Review and who has just put in tremendous time and effort into making this symposium a reality. I also want to acknowledge all of our law review editors who work tirelessly, both in terms of standing up this great symposium and in terms of putting out quality legal publications. I want to acknowledge their um, advisor, Professor Rennell Anderson-Jones, who does a fantastic job of helping our law review and providing them um, very valuable guidance. I also want to thank our labs, our law and biomedical sciences faculty. Um, I'll turn, over, turn it over to one of them soon, um, Professor Tennille Brown, but also Dr. Leslie Francis, uh, George Contreras, Amelia Reinhardt smith and um, also Erica George for their tremendous work with in relation to the Law and Biomedical Sciences uh, Center. And last but not least, uh, because truly they are amazing and uh, this conference and symposium would not be possible without their help, I want to acknowledge and thank our events and IT team who are the team behind the scenes who really do make this um, symposium possible and will make it hopefully be a seamless and enjoyable event. Um, you won't see that them because uh, they do tend to stay behind the scenes. Um, but I want to thank our events team leader, Chris Monty, for her work on this. Um, Spencer Cope and Crystal Bagley are both uh, currently, their video screens are turned off, but they are working hard to make sure that this conference is a success. And there are many other members of our teams who work so hard on these events. So a huge thank you for them to them for their time and effort. Um, so thank you for joining us. We're glad you're here. I can promise you that this is going to be a great conference. And with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Tennille Brown. Professor Brown? 
Great, thank you so much uh, to the Dean for that welcome. Uh, how's everybody doing? I know we can't see you, but thank you for coming. Uh, I can see we have a terrific turnout today. Uh, we're really fortunate to the deans, to the Dean for her leadership here at the College of Law and for all of your support of the interdisciplinary research we're doing uh, between medicine and law. So I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel this morning, our first panel of our Law Review Symposium, sharing medical research data. We are fortunate to have with us three leading experts in this area. We'll be discussing privacy, confidentiality, restrictions, and potentially new and exciting uses of research data. We're going to kick it off with remarks by Professor Kate Spector Baghdadi, followed by Professor Nicholson Price and Professor Leslie Wool, who will provide some responding commentary. Then we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, please submit your questions as they occur to you through the Q&A, and we can then upvote those or participants can, uh, people can suggest whether or not they have a thumbs up, they wanna hear that question being asked. I'll introduce the three speakers now and then hand it over to Professor Spector. So Kate Spector Baghdadi is an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Michigan Medical School. Go blue. She is also the chief of the research ethics service in the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine, where she serves as chair of the research ethics committee the ethicist on the Michigan Medicine Human Data and Biospecimen Release Committee, and a clinical ethicist. She is a lawyer and bioethicist by training, and her excellent research focuses on the ethics and regulation of secondary research use of health data and human biospecimens. During COVID, uh, Professor Spector has focused on ethical clinical trial design and recruitment, the effects of racism on access to care and therapeutics, and the equitable distribution of scarce resources. She has published in leading medical ethics journals as well as media outlets, her recent pieces have made a big splash in the medical research field and have appeared in such first rate places as the New England Journal, Science, Nature Medicine, and USA Today, among others. Our next panelist is Nicholson Price. Professor Nicholson Price is a professor of law and has perhaps the best collection of bow ties on the planet. Prove me wrong. Uh, he teaches and writes in the areas of intellectual property, health law, and regulation, particularly focusing on the law surrounding innovation in the life sciences. He previously was an academic fellow at the Petrie Flom Center at Harvard, and he clerked for the Honorable Carlos B. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He has done truly pathbreaking work on the role of machine learning and artificial intelligence in healthcare systems. Next up, uh, Leslie Wolf. Professor Leslie Wolf is interim dean and distinguished university professor and professor of law with appointments in the College of Law and the School of Public Health at Georgia State. Wolf served as director of the Center for Law, Health and Society from 2014 to 2019. She is a leading national scholar in health law, public health and ethics with a focus on research ethics. Her research has appeared in some of the most prestigious medical and public health journals in the country, as well as in law reviews and is widely cited by scholars nationally and internationally. Her research has been funded by a number of institutes at NIH and the Greenwall Foundation. She's made stellar contributions to the law of participant protections and consent, particularly in genomic research. So please join me in welcoming our three experts. I know you can't clap, but I'll be clapping for us. And I will now turn the time over to Professor Spector. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to be here. This is a great opportunity. Um, so I'm gonna talk to us briefly about um, my area of focus, which is sort of the legal and ethical tensions in health data procurement and use. And this is a brief summary of my argument, uh, but I'll cut to the chase. So one, biospecimens and health data are governed by method of procurement, by the method in which we collect the specimens and health data. What contributors, so what patients and participants and consumers actually care about is how we use those data and specimens after we collect them. However, biospecimens and health data that are procured differently end up being used in many of the same ways. And our current regulatory mechanisms or market forces have not reconciled this tension between how we govern data and specimens and what people actually care about. And so the last question is, do we care? Should we do anything about that? It's a very valuable and lucrative market as it is, should we shift things? So, you know, this is, an entire health law course, but quickly in one slide. Um, when I say that data and specimens are governed by method of procurement, we have our data silos, and generally HIPAA governs identifiable clinical data and specimens, 
the common rule 45 CFR 46 govern subpart A because I'm in a law review symposium governs some identified research with data and biospecimens and maybe FDA, FTC, CMS have some involvement with commercial data applications. But what people actually care about is not how their data or their specimens got into the system generally, but rather is about use. So we know that most people uh, actually have a sort of expectation that they're going to be asked if their data or their specimens are being used in research. In this one survey um, at the top of cancer patients specifically, 35% um, of them want specific research consent for even secondary research. And that raises to almost 50% of patients among black and Hispanic patients. Um, people also care about who has access to de-identified medical information. And then this last study that I'll cite really quickly is by my colleague, Ray DeVries. And what he found, so much of what we do in research is we ask for participants to sign these broad consent forms so we can essentially do whatever kind of research we want with their secondary, any kind of secondary research we want with their data. And he found that if we ask people, do you mind signing this broad consent? About 70% of people said, sure, that's fine. But then when we went back and said, well, what if the research is about improving weapons of mass destruction? What if the research is about improving methods of abortion? Um, about 70% of those people changed their minds. So that's the first point. Um, but then biospecimens and health data that are procured differently through these silos and governed differently in these silos end up being used in similar ways. So just as an example um, from the University of Michigan, sort of our standard clinical consent form says that we can do anything that is legally allowable with specimens and data. The regulations are much more specific in terms of what we have to disclose to research participants. So there's a lot more detail in our research participant forms for secondary research. Um, and you know, this is this is not just us. This is across the country where actually institutions are treating data and specimens that come from patients and participants differently because participants actually have more protections. Um, this is another piece that we did showing the sort of rapid increase of academics publishing with data that um, are held by private entities. So you can actually see that bottom line is uh, private entities publishing their own findings with their data. Um, but that middle line, the thing that's really driving up that curve is academic researchers publishing with private genetic data sets. And almost 50% of those articles are actually have some sort of federal funding. And then the last point, and Professor Price is gonna go into this a little more because we co-authored this, but there's a lot going on in the commercial side as well with commercial entities collecting data that are de-identified or allowable under different data silos and then putting them back together in ways that may make people uncomfortable. So we know how they're governed and we know that people are uncomfortable with this and have different expectations than what's actually happening. But, you know, there's, there's nothing really in the regulations that are protecting, protecting this difference. Um, and if you think about it, if you think when you're trying to write a policy or trying to write a regulation, it's really easy to regulate what needs to be included in a 20 page document. And then you can go back and you can check and ensure that it was included, but it's really hard to regulate a conversation. And that is reflected in the human subjects research regulations where there's all this stuff about what has to be in the consent form, but very little about the conversation when we actually know the conversation is what works. So this is a, this is a study that I like because uh, it totally failed. Um, but what we did was we went in and we started interviewing cancer patients who were enrolling in one of our precision medicine biobanks. And the intent of it was that we had found in previous research that people were dissuaded from enrolling in our biobank and our data bank <clears throat> if they knew that we were going to commercialize their data or specimens, which means sell it to private entities. And so the intent of this research had been to say, well, what can we use the money for that would make you feel better, that would encourage you to enroll? And actually what happened is more interesting, I think. So this is the, um, the citation from the regulation that says that we have to disclose that specimens or date specimens may be used for commercial profit. Here is a just a brief section of our very long informed consent form, um, which we fully disclose all the potential uses 
and the patients willingly signed. And then we went in and we started interviewing both patients and the referring clinician, right? So not the clinical researchers, but the clinician who said, oh, I have a cancer patient that might be interested in enrolling in your precision medicine protocol. And the first patient, we, my poor study coordinator went in and started asking and the patient said, I hope you don't because I don't think you said you would or, or did you? I don't remember the consent form. Well, I'd get my lawyer because you promised that none of my personal information would be given to anyone outside the university. And when we talked to this patient's referring clinician, he said, well, I hope we aren't selling the data to 23andMe. Patients trusted in us that we have a trial where we're the sole people in charge of their information. I would think that we would need to have a secondary approval from patients, like the one we painstakingly put them through. Um, so we know that consent doesn't work. We know that consent doesn't work no matter how much information that we be give people in informed consent forms. And it's even worse on the private side because people don't even read them. At least we somewhat ensure that patients are looking at the informed consent form and have a, try to have a conversation. But on the private side, nobody's even looking at the information to begin with. So do we care? Should we do anything in an attempt to fix this? So there's a couple problems. So there's a lot of problems um, that we might want to talk about, but, but let me, I'm gonna highlight a couple. So if we're setting up this sort of binary system where academic medical centers have to clear regulatory hurdles that are much higher than, um, than private industry collecting data, right? So we have to get all these layers of consent, notice, um, ensure best practices. And then in private industry, they're just collecting the data. Sort of as an example, the US government has this new um, data bank called All of Us. And in that data bank, um, they've been recruiting for several years now, and they have about 200,000 people that have been fully recruited. And 80% of those are people from communities that are traditionally underrepresented in research. However, um, and they, but they've spent over a billion dollars building this database. And also 80% of 200,000 people isn't a ton of people anyway, when you're talking about genetics research, but it really is uh, just, it's way too small if you're talking about trying to make any sort of genetic variant findings across the population, because those 80% of people can be diverse in totally different ways. And what you need is people who are diverse in the same way in order to make some genetic advances. So we've got sort of this tension between private industry and academia. And one of the fundamental problems of this that I think is access, right? So if uh, academic genetic researchers are increasingly turning to industry for the data they need for their research, then industry gets to decide which research goes forward and which research doesn't. Um, this also limits researchers' ability to validate work or build derivative discoveries, and it also can decrease future access. Um, for those of you who didn't take a class that discussed Myriad, it's sort of the traditional example where Myriad um, patented a genetic variant on the BRCA gene, a, three genetic variants on the BRCA gene associated with an increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer in Ashkenazi Jewish women, and had that patent for decades until the Supreme Court invalidated the ability to patent a variant um, in 2013. And so the day after, all these new tests flooded the market for this for this, um, for this variant, except for the fact that they didn't have the kind of reference data set that they needed to return um, nuanced findings and actually predict health outcomes for a patient population. Because Myriad, you know, now it couldn't, wasn't just the only entity that could collect the test, but it was the only entity that had this decades worth of this variant leads to this and these kinds of people that reference data set that's so critical. And the other thing that I will say is the challenge of diversity, right? So we know that genetic wide association studies, um, so there's, there's one article clip from there that shows that even today, less than 5% of these data that end up in GWAS studies are from people other than Caucasian or Asian ancestry. A recent finding in the NHGRI GWAS catalog found that only 2.4% of participants were of African ancestry. And this is bad both for members of diverse ancestral communities as well as everyone because 
another interesting point is that even though 2.4% of participants were of African ancestry, they actually, those variants led to 7% of the findings. So these things are bad for everybody when we don't encourage diversity. And they can also skew research agendas and lead to misdiagnoses or underdiagnosis when we don't know what a genetic variant means in a certain population. So a couple of solutions and just quickly, um, so we're unlikely to fix this regulatorily anytime soon. Um, we just spent six years updating the common rule and we didn't fix it and we're unlikely to fix it and update the common rule anytime soon. Um, so the things that I recommend are standards that are held by entities other than the government. So one, academics, academic medical centers like my own, we can hold ourselves to a higher standard than the regulations. That's always sort of surprising when you go into rooms full of lawyers and IRB members when you're saying, well, yes, that's legally required, but we, we could do better. Um, or journal standards, that's another way. Journals have actually made a lot of progress in this area by requiring certain kinds of disclosures and consent. Um, so I will just end with the example of what we have done recently at the University of Michigan. So we have set up these sort of higher standards, um, the regulations with the theory that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So if we know that patients and participants have different expectations, and expect to be more protected than they actually are. If we raise our standards of informed consent, then we're more likely to be responsive to any individual concern, right? Because if patients, we know they're concerned, we know that they're not fully understanding the informed consent forms. So what can we do to ensure that what we're doing is actually more in line with their expectations um, and what they would want to consent to if they understood at baseline? So we do a couple of specific things to try to raise those standards, particularly for commercialization. So that was a summation of my talk and I look forward to questions and feedback. Great, thank you so much for that. I think we'll move next to Nicholson. Or it, did you have a preference? We're planning on going next. Okay, Nicholson. I, we'll, we'll have excellent, next. great, terrific. Uh, I don't have slides. Um, uh, so it's just me. Um, thanks so much for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's always uh, uh, challenging to go after Professor Spector because um, she's got some really awesome things to say. But I guess uh, part of my role is to say a little bit and just shoot out in a, uh, another direction and to do a little bit of commentary. So uh, uh, at least I can um, uh, surf off of the, the work that Professor Spector has been doing. So I want to take this discussion about medical data and about privacy in medical data uh, in particular. Uh, Professor Spector was more on the consent side. I'm going to talk a little bit about the privacy side, which is obviously connected with that. Uh, and I want to add in the uh, additional element of artificial intelligence, um, because that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. So why not? Uh, and so artificial intelligence, right, is the use of machine learning algorithms where basically big fancy computer systems discern patterns in large amounts of data and we can use those to figure stuff out. Uh, and so in particular, I wanna talk about this impact in two directions. Uh, I wanna talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on medical privacy and on medical data. Uh, and then I wanna talk about the opposite, which is to say the impact of uh, medical privacy or consent uh, rules uh, on medical AI. So I wanna look at this relationship in both directions. So first off, uh, how does AI change how we might think uh, about privacy and access to and restrictions on uh, medical data? And the basic point I wanna make here is uh, AI makes protections for medical data in general uh, much weaker. Um, so the easiest way to see this is to think about de-identification or anonymization, which is in general, the get out of jail free card from effectively all of the restrictions on medical data. You're worried about HIPAA, de-identify it. You're worried about informed consent, de-identify it. Congratulations, these restrictions that would normally limit what you can do mostly go out the window. Not entirely, but if you de-identify them, like you can do a lot more stuff than you otherwise normally could. Um, but of course, this relies on the idea that de-identified data are really de-identified. Uh, 
Uh, and there have been proof of concept attacks where people say, hey, no, I can figure this out by looking really carefully through a bunch of data sets and triangulating and doing some things. It turns out AI makes that a lot easier. It makes it much, much easier to re-identify data and just to reconnect data sets where you've got one data set that is de-identified and therefore kind of freely usable or more freely usable and another data set that is identifiable and you can find the links and the connections between those things, right? If I've got a data set of prescription databases and those are de-identified and therefore out from the restrictions of HIPAA and informed consent. And on the other hand, I have a database of uh, credit card transactions and all the things that CBS sells and that I have names on, well, it's not that hard to link them back together and AI makes it much easier to do that on a large scale. And so uh, this is uh, the, the work that Professor Spector mentioned where uh, she and I, along with Professor Margot Kaminsky and Professor Timo Minson uh, wrote about what we called shadow health records, uh, where it was in fact, was and is uh, quite easy for large data broker companies to link together uh, uh, de-identified health records and other kinds of information about your health. Uh, and AI is kind of a, an enabling technology that lets them create health records that are largely uh, outside the, the scrutiny or the restrictions of informed consent uh, or privacy rules. There's this idea of data triangulation where you bring different things together and can create pretty comprehensive, uh, pretty unregulated data sets. Uh, it's also true that in the sense, uh, so, uh, sorry, riffing on uh, Professor Spector's fact that what we care about is use. We don't care just about the use of the data. We care about what companies know uh, more than we care about how they got there. Uh, and so the provenance of data, as Professor, as Professor Spector said, you know, whether it comes from just ordinary clinical care or research use or whatever, those both have some level of informed consent, some level of privacy protection. But when you're surfing the web or when you're buying things at Target, uh, if that information can be used to generate the exact same inferences about your health, well, then that's what you really care about. You care about what people know and what they do with that knowledge about your health. Now, you might care a little bit more if your doctor told them, but if someone else knows things about you and it's a say a corporation that you don't wish to know those things about you and they knew it by data mining otherwise publicly accessible data that's still kind of a bummer from your perspective uh, and potentially a privacy challenge uh, jeff skopek who's at cambridge university uh raises this interesting question about you know when ai infers knowledge about you is that a privacy violation in the same way as it would if it just was told the knowledge about you or if the system were told the knowledge so ask the question, you know, if you, if you meet a colleague at a dinner party uh, and she announces that she has stopped drinking uh, wine and soft cheeses, uh, eating soft cheeses and uh, eating raw fish, you might infer that she's pregnant and that doesn't seem like a privacy violation. Uh, is it different when AI does that uh, based on a set of data that it observes from the world? Uh, one last thing I'll say about the impact of AI on medical privacy. Uh, I was at a talk that I thought was last privacy last Friday, uh, but it turns out it was actually three Fridays ago because time has no meaning. Uh, and someone mentioned uh, the use of artificial intelligence to create fully synthetic data sets. Super cool, amazing technology. The idea here is rather than just take existing data sets and kind of fuzz it up a little bit to preserve privacy, which is a thing we can do. Instead, this is take AI and train it in such a way that it generates a completely made up data set that nonetheless reflects the relationships in the individual data set. So you actually can't see anyone's data. How cool is that? It's AI protecting privacy. But then it turns out that you can take another AI and look at that fully synthetic data set. That is no real data at all but because it reflects relationships in the real world, a new AI can take that and learn things about real people and find real data about real individual people from that fully synthetic data set. Fascinating uh, kind of example of an arms race uh, and how AI makes it harder to kind of stick with what we think of as existing restrictions on uh, data based on consent or privacy regimes.
All right, so overall, I think AMI makes privacy rules and consent rules kind of weird and wadgy and weaker than we might otherwise think. All right, how about the other direction? Well, I just said AI makes privacy rules weaker, so maybe the answer is I shouldn't care about the impact of privacy rules on AI, but actually I totally do. I think even though it makes privacy rules weaker, uh, it's privacy rules and consent rules and the way that they're structured in the ways that Professor Spector was talking about are also likely to negatively impact the way that medical AI develops and is trained and learns and performs. And in particular, I think part of the issue here uh, is again, as Professor Spector said, that the protections that exist are substantially more important and more burdensome hurdles for academics and nonprofit entities and entities trying to do fundamental work or trying to validate or verify uh, commercial products that they didn't develop than for commercial entities who are using these sorts of shadow health record or other workarounds. What does that mean? It means it's harder for academic entities to collect representative data sets and therefore to reduce the potential for bias going forward. Fewer resources are available to do things like obtain robust consent. If it's the case that the only way to make sure that patients are really okay with secondary research is using is, is undergoing uh, intense real conversations, right? The places with the resources to undergo those sorts of conversations are not the places that serve all of the communities and all the folks whose data we think are important to developing representative non-biased AI. It's going to be the case that data sets that are available for AI are, at least on the nonprofit side, on the academic side, are more typically developed at fancy high resource health centers, like the University of Michigan, like uh, Harvard Medical School, like Duke, which it turns out are places that are developing these big data sets. One data set, Mimic, which was trained at, I think, uh, Beth Israel Deaconess uh, Emergency Room, is the basis of a huge amount of artificial intelligence products in medicine. And part of the reason for that is it's a rich hospital, which can go through the process and jump over all of the hurdles that Professor Spector was just mentioning. So what does this do? Uh, it creates biases in terms of what the, a, the what the resulting medical AI learns to do, right? I've talked about AI in a couple of different contexts. One of them is AI that's learning things from data and re-aggregating things. Another is the AI that might be influencing your care and saying, here's the right drug for you, or here's whether or not you have skin cancer based on that photo. And if those AIs are, those AI systems are trained on biased, incomplete, non-representative data, that's gonna be bad for everyone in terms of the care that they provide. So solutions, I wish I had delightful solutions. I totally don't have delightful solutions. Um, personally, I think it's very strange that we privilege medical privacy so much over other sorts of data. I think it's very odd that we say, hey, we're gonna have relatively strict rules about what you can do from data that are developed in the context of a doctor-patient relationship. Um, or in a hospital, and if the same data are revealed through your web search, we really only care about the first and not about the second. That seems deeply weird to me. Um, as to whether we level up or level down, I'm a little bit more agnostic. I recognize that part of that is a reflection of my privilege uh, and the fact that I am less worried, at least at the current moment, about downstream consequences of people knowing information about my health. Uh, there are many people for whom those worries are much more salient, uh, but I think it's a really difficult conclusion to justify that the right answer is we're gonna put up a lot of procedural hurdles to potentially really socially valuable research about data in the context where that research is most likely to happen, but basically everywhere else, we're not so worried about it. That seems odd to me. And with that, I'll stop and I look forward to your questions uh, or thoughts and to uh, hearing the rest of the panel. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Professor Price. And next up, Professor Wolf. Well, I wanna add my thanks to everybody else's for uh, have the opportunity to participate today. Um, it's been fascinating so far and I enjoy this. So I am focused on a certificate of confidentiality, which is an area of research that I've been doing for the past 20 years. 
Um, and I wanna acknowledge sort of where Nicholson just ended and where Kate started, and that is to acknowledge this weirdness that is in our law that we do uh, treat data differently depending on where they come from. And, um, and that is certainly true in what I'm about to talk about. Um, okay, now I can. Um, so what is a certificate of confidentiality? It is a federal legal tool to that was adopted to facilitate conduct of research on sensitive research. Um, and it grants authority to avoid compelled disclosure of identifiable information. And this breadth is important. In any federal, state, or local civil, criminal, administrative, legislative, or other proceedings. So I wanna unpack that. So why do we have the certificate? Um, this goes a little bit, again, to where Nicholson sort of ended. It's thinking about things differently of, of where things started. And um, the certificate was adopted in 1970 to facilitate research on illegal drug use. It was part of the war on drugs where to do the research that was necessary, participants basically needed to say, hey, I engage in felonious activity. Um, and the fear was that they either, researchers were not gonna be able to do the research they needed to um, because nobody would participate um, or they would otherwise put their participants at risk. Um, so given the time at the time, the interest the government had in this, they adopted the certificate. It applied only to illegal drug use at the time. Over the course of a couple of decades, the scope expanded until it basically um, covered any kind of research as this language here suggests. Um, and it came through and, and how I got started doing this research in HIV research um, and then on to other things, genetics being one of them. And then in, most recently there were changes effectuated in 2016 under the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, so certificates apply only to research. So does not apply to the commercial databases. Um, and whereas historically it used to be something that people applied for, um, and so it was people who were doing the work, um, the early uh, illegal substance use research and or the people doing HIV related research. Now it is mandatory issue for federally funded research. So if you are doing federally funded research, the secretary has to issue it rather than a having discretion authority under an application. And NIH has decided to apply this by automatically issuing it to it research it funds. If it involves a human subject research that could be subject to the certificate. It still retains the ability to apply for a certificate for non-federally funded research, which was true under the old statute. Um, but that can be denied. It's not a mandatory issue. Um, and historically there have been cases. So for example, if it's not within the NIH mission, uh, to give you a good example of that, stem cell research. When unable to be funded by the federal research, NIH was not going to issue a certificate under those circumstances. Uh, now post 20, 21st century cures, uh, you get all, uh, clarification that the protections apply to all copies in perpetuity and that identifiable, identifiable data are not admissible in any legal proceeding. So if data is disclosed, it should not be able to be used against an individual, although that is not the only place where the information could create problems. So in terms of disclosure, again, historically, despite very strong language about protections, you could voluntarily disclose information. And that was the way that they encouraged researchers to comply with reporting of communicable diseases or reporting of abuse um, or harm to self or others. Now you cannot, they took away the voluntary disclosure and you can only disclose research information that is otherwise protected by a certificate if it fits within listed exceptions. These include individual consent, 
for medical treatment with individual consent. And I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know why they decided they needed to repeat that. Um, for research purposes, if it complies with federal regulations for research, and as required by federal, state, and local law, when that is not the source of a subpoena, right? So if it's not a compelled disclosure, um, it's others. And I will be talking about that momentarily. Um, so when we look at this, my colleague Laura Baskow and I are looking at a couple of potential gaps. Um, one is that research data is more commonly being incorporated into electronic health records. Um, and because of the change such that now it's very clear the protection applies to all copies in perpetuity, as the NIH kiosk on, uh, on certificates says, that data is going to be protected by the certificate. So it doesn't matter now that it's in the hands of the researcher, it's in the hands of somebody else. But who's going to remember, who's going to know that this data should be treated differently if requested than it would be if it were just in the medical record? And, you know, in the, as we look at HIPAA, we know there, are, we think of it as very strong protections, but the exceptions are very, very lengthy. Um, it also undermines a strategy that when we talk to legal counsel about their experiences with certificates, um, they were using to try to avoid having a certificate challenged. So when information in the re research record was also available in the medical record, they would frequently just say, go ask for it, the medical record. Um, so I don't have to fight about this in court but if the research data is now embedded in that, it eliminates one way of, um, that they've practically tried to protect the research data. Um, a probably bigger gap, in my opinion, is what I refer to as the potential Mack truck exception. Because disclosure is permitted as required by federal, state, and local law, that goes well beyond what we historically thought of as the exception for communicable diseases and reporting. This is really unbounded. And as our prior research, looking at what we refer to as the web of legal protections um, revealed, there are just myriad of state laws that have an impact on, or potential impact on research. And we were just looking at four relatively discrete areas. And if we start thinking up truly about as required by any federal, state, or local law, um, it's going to be much, much larger. So we started trying to think of what might some examples be. And so imagine, if you will, a study that is looking at substance abuse and pregnancy. Um, directed at that and uh, whether it's medical or behavioral treatment and you're trying to improve things, um, that would be a classic example for what a certificate was intended to use. But also if you're doing a study in which you are doing a regular, to a regular toxicology screen and not excluding pregnant women, the researcher may, be have, may have to report that information to Child Protective Service or whatever the agency is called in that particular state, um, depending on which state they're in. So researchers must report substance abuse in and around pregnancy in states where any person is a mandated reporter or they're identified as their profession or licensure rather than being in a treatment relationship and where that state also has an abuse and neglect statute that applies to use of controlled substances during pregnancy or where there's evidence after delivery. Um, so participants in such a study may be subject to an investigation, may risk losing custody, even though that's precisely the kind of circumstance in which a researcher might have applied for a certificate previously, right, that they want to give the reassurance to participants that they will not be subject to an investigation or legal, legal harm. Another possibility is if you're doing a study of cognitive or functional impairment, 
or you're doing a cohort study that is routinely administering cognitive tests. And this one is a little bit narrower because the obligation to report is on physician resource, physicians, so physician researchers, um, but they have to, in certain states, report certain conditions, which may affect the ability to drive. And so again, participants may be subject to investigation, may uh, experience loss of license, with all the potential financial implications and loss of independence that ensues from that. And if you've ever been involved with a discussion with a family member, you know how significant and important that is uh, to those involved. So these are just illustrative. Uh, we are just beginning to try to think about what really might be the full scope of this exception. Um, so from our perspective, you know, the 21st Century Cures Act made some really important bene ben beneficial changes to the um, certificate statute, but these gaps may actually undermine protections and participant trust because sort of what Kate was saying from her, um, what she heard from her participants, you know, you didn't tell me that you were going to do that, or in fact, you actively promised me you were going to do certain things, um, and now you're telling me you're not, and look where I am. The other thing that I wanna mention, and it relates to um, both our previous research and research we're undertaking at the moment, is that the variation in state law may result in very different protections um, depending on where the participants are. Because there are substantial variations with states. Um, and it's you know, kind of interesting to think about the implications of what um, Michigan is trying to do, which I applaud. I think it's great to try to elevate what we're doing in terms of participant protection on an individual level, but it also creates these opportunities and challenges where people may be protected differently, uh, particularly in multi-state studies, depending on where they happen to be participating all right, and where they're located or where the information is located. And we're actually looking at choice of law questions that are under embedded in that as well. Um, and I find it a little bit troubling to think about that, although it is also just part and parcel of the kind of uh, system that we have. So um, I'm just gonna acknowledge this is uh, funded in part by our recent, current research grant. And of course, it's only our views and to say thank you. And I look forward to um, engaging further. And should anybody have any thoughts about other ways these laws could be, uh, please email me. I, I, we're, we're still thinking those through. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And uh, we actually have quite a few terrific questions. That's Walter, my dog. Uh, we have quite a few terrific questions here in the Q&A. So I think uh, we'll start with a question for Professor Spector. Uh, it says, you mentioned that when patients are informed of the use of their specimens data in greater detail, it has raised concern among consenting patients. Has UMICH experienced a decline in trial interest and enrollment as a result of a more thorough consent process? If so, has this been an impediment to conducting trials where large population samples are necessary? How does this phenomenon intersect with subpopulations with unique medical research interests, i.e. African-Americans, Latinos, et cetera? Good question. Um, so yes, so the short answer is yes, it has affected us a little. So we implemented a, this new, a new informed consent process that had sort of an easy to read pamphlet and had sort of the cartoons talking to each other, like all of sort of the best practice things that people like at Sage Bio Networks are releasing. Um, and we did see a decrease in enrollment once participant, once there was an increase in comprehension. Um, so, so yes, although um, whether that has actually had a substantive and causal decrease in what we're able to do is not quite clear yet. Um, I will say that Professor Price and I are also part of a team that is doing sort of a demographic diversity assessment of our current method of getting consent um, with our computer science and our precision medicine colleagues that has been really interesting. And we have generally found that um, the things that are happening to our database are those which are hypothesized to happen to these databases and all of the qualitative studies that we and other teams around the country have been doing, i.e., um, you know, people, uh, our patients of color are potentially less likely to be approached to enroll in databanks due to 
certain either logistical or other types of factors. And then um, they're less likely to enroll. Um, and, but I think a really important thread through all of this is we need to sort of turn those back onto ourselves. It's really easy to say, well, those people won't enroll. So the problem is a lack of enrollment as opposed to saying, how are we not being responsive? How are we not being engaged? How is our consent process white centric or male centric in a way that we are not being welcome and we're not acting in trustworthy ways? So that is still a process we're very much undergoing at Michigan, but I think it's important. That's great. What a great example for so many other institutions. Uh, did any of the other panelists want to remark on that question or no? Okay, great. Then we will move on to the next question. Uh, let's see here. This is a question. I'm not going to go exactly in the order that they're here, just kind of move around. But this is a question for Professor Price. To what extent are the databases incorporating data points surrounding social determinants of health, if at all, such as you know wealth, nutrition, things like that? Are those data points being captured? Oh, I think, yes, very much. Um, interestingly enough, this is a place where uh, there are, like sometimes the, the places where we expect kind of uh, uh, fundamental knowledge research to happen, we see this a little bit less because these data aren't as accessible to um, uh, academic researchers. But I think on the commercial side of things, on the kind of data mining side of things, on the shadow health record side of things, very much these social determinants of health are a piece of the picture. Now, potentially, right, that's, that's hugely positive, right? It's great if our models of kind of what's likely to be good care, what are likely to be problems, actually incorporate all the things that are influencing people's health outside the medical context. Like, that's something social determinant of health scholars have been arguing would be a great thing for a long time. Like I, I'm, I, I am in favor of this. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think they're there. I don't think they're everywhere. Um, again, I think that these are the kinds of things that are more likely to be showing up in commercial databases than they are in uh, nonprofit uh, or academic databases, uh, even more so in, in Europe, where interestingly enough, like lots of data sets, um, you can't even record uh, some aspects of social determinants of health or even include this uh, in data sets, mm -hmm. which, is, which is fascinating to me. Yeah, that's very interesting. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Of course. So Professor Price, so I was on a call for like three hours yesterday, talking like very animatedly, talking with colleagues about the use of race as a proxy for the effects of racism. And as you know, many of these databanks banks use race as a proxy for the social determinant effects of racism. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about sort of any perspective that you have on that topic and sort of race as a shorthand for any number of things. Yeah, so I think, I think one of the things that's neat about big data and AI is to some extent, it lets you try to get around proxies, right? If the answer is I come in or a patient comes into a physician's uh, uh, office and has, you know, a health record that includes, you know, here are blood pressure readings and height and weight and whatever. And you can also see the race of the patient or they declared their race to you. Like that's a proxy for a bunch of stuff that you otherwise don't get unless you take a really good medical history. And so like, there are lots of problems with using race as a proxy. There are also ways in which it ends up influencing care in which ways that are sometimes useful to improve care. Um, if you have lots more data and you can actually look at the underlying factors that are actually mattering, if you know the patient's genetic variants, if you know their socioeconomic status, if you know more about their social history, those sorts of things, and you can put it into a big machine that chews it up and spits out useful, actionable information, right? race becomes much less important as a proxy. Now, I should say like the flip side of that is also true. So I'm thinking here of the work of Anya Prince and Daniel Schwartz uh, about proxy discrimination in an age of AI, which is to say, um, if you don't need to use race as a proxy because you can access the underlying stuff through AI or big data, it is also the case that if you try to stop discrimination on the basis of race and you have lots of data and you have access to AI and machine learning, 
you can still have policies that do in fact discriminate on the basis of race by using those uh, correlations. So it's really tough uh, to figure out ways to actively work to kind of prevent uh, discrimination in that sense. That's great. Professor Spector, did you want to respond or? No, I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, super interesting. Um, I think we'll move now to a question for uh, Professor Wolf. Uh, Professor Wolf, some people seem to think that a certificate of confidentiality will protect DNA against state, local, federal criminal search warrants, yet this does not seem to be accurate. Are there efforts to expand certificate protections to criminal investigations? And if so, how would you analyze the constitutionality of such protections, i.e. the interaction of the federal certificates with the state police power? And there was another question dealing with Sixth Amendment concerns, uh, how those ought to be uh, sort of the trade-offs ought to be considered by courts. So there's, you know, many things embedded in that, right? The, the concern um, in the investigation, if what they've done is come and with their subpoena, regardless of where it comes from, the certificate should hold, all right? And the one thing I can say from a criminal law perspective, the one case that anybody who cites any case involving certificate cites is a criminal case that's sort of like this. All right. So in, the, um, you know, it's back in the day and it was from 1973 and it involved a methadone clinic and they wanted photographs, not DNA, but it occurred because a woman who is a patient in the clinic said, I saw the murderer at the clinic. And so they wanted the photo array. You have photos because you don't want to give methadone to the wrong person. So to match up, yes, you are in fact the person who's entitled to it. They had pictures of all the patients. So witness, you were here from 10 to 11 on X day. Here are the other patients. Here's the array. The cl um, clinic, because it was part of research at the time, had a certificate and the director of the clinic refused to provide the information and the director of the clinic was willing to go to court and, or, and, and suffer and willing to go to jail to protect that, felt strongly enough about it. And it went up to the Supreme Court or the highest court in New York and the court um, upheld the certificate. And so from a factual perspective, enormously um, powerful right? We're not going to hand you over the, the murderer, even though we could, because we think this research is vitally important. Now, if you read the case itself, it spends about most of the time talking about, well, there's this 1970 statute and this 1972 statute, and did the 72 statute really change things? And at the very end, they're like, yeah, yeah, you don't get those photos. Um, so from a, from a legal perspective, it was not a through full-throated, you know, support for this is just vitally important. Um, so expectation is you're probably not going to get the DNA that what keeps us up at night, those of us who think about this thing um, and think that the protection is important is the flip side where somebody says there's going to be exoner, you know, exculpatory information there and I'm a criminal defendant. And there, the idea that we're going to prevent that um, getting access to the information when a, somebody's freedom is at stake. Um, and we don't have that case. We have, you know, adjacent cases that don't hit that issue more. Uh, there was a, you know, a criminal defendant who wanted information um, to go after a witness. And uh, so uh, just not there. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, so I think we'll move back up to the questions in the queue. Uh, this is a question for Professor Spector. Do you see a tension between private and academic genetic biobanks based on the need for monopolies? Uh, should biobanks be treated more like regulated entities like energy systems or communication services? Um, I guess I would push back on the concept of the need for monopoly. So it certainly is quite helpful to have a monopoly on all the data, although I think I think by and large, those have been broken down. It's, so it's sort of less of a monopoly and more of a sort of size, right? Um, so it's not that other data banks can't attempt to uh, collect the same kind of data and specimens, but they are at such a disadvantage and are so many years behind, we're unlikely to catch up. 
So I think the second part of the question was about sort of treating um, data and specimens as a common good and regulating them as we regulate, you know, um, environment. And I think that is quite an intriguing concept. And there's also been a lot of literature on this. Um, Amy McGuire and Bob Cook Deegan sort of co-hosted an entire issue of the Journal of Law, Medicine and Ethics on sort of data, the data commons. Um, yeah, I, and so I, I think it's a really compelling analogy. And um, the, the problem is, is that there's not currently a single piece of legislation or a single entity that governs all of the data. So NIH is trying to create these types of data and biobank, common data banks um, through its All of Us biobank, and as well as requiring that NIH funded researchers give their data back to NIH and some of, some of the data enclaves for other researchers to access, which has been more or less effective. So we're trying, but we're behind the ball and we have both arms tied behind us in terms of the regulations. And that's why it's sort of resulting in what looked like a monopoly. Great, thank you. Would either panelists wanna answer that one or no? I, I would just add, not to answer, but um, add to it that uh, the it's not just the federal laws and that they it, we treat the genomic information differently than we treat the health data, than we treat the lifestyle data. Um, and then there, that's, and that's what we tend to think about the federal laws and how they interact and don't, and the gaps, the known gaps there. But then there's this whole host of laws in states that underlie that, that may require different consent requirements depending on the type of data, that may add um, additional protections depending on the type of data. And it's not consistent um, with by data and it's not consistent by states, which just makes this whole thing a whole lot more complicated. Right. Yeah, I, um, I, I completely agree with, uh, with both of my co-panelists on this. Um, I, I'm in favor of thinking about kind of data for health as, I like an infrastructure model. Like data feels like infrastructure for innovation and infrastructure for health to me, uh, in as much as it's really, it's expensive to gather, it's expensive to curate, it's expensive to do stuff with. Um, there are real benefits to scale and connectivity, and it has a huge number of potentially really useful downstream uses. Uh, and we don't know in advance exactly what those are going to be. Um, and so this is this is drawing to some extent on, on Brett, Frisch, Brett Frischman's uh, uh, conception of kind of infrastructure and how the law should treat infrastructure. Uh, and so when we put all of those things together, it, it strikes me that to say that this is something which indeed, yes, should be treated as something like uh, a regulated industry or frankly have a ton of government investment in building up that infrastructure. Um, so all of us is, I think, a big step in the right direction. Um, and I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, a score or two more steps in exactly that direction. Great, thank you. So uh, we have a question that's received uh, four votes. Last January, the WSJ Wall Street Journal reported on a number of confidential contracts between Google and large US health systems to acquire large volumes of health data. Any thoughts from our panelists on ways to get more sunshine on these types of arrangements? Ethical debate is difficult when much of this activity is hidden from the public. Any thoughts or reactions to that? I don't know which side I'm on, Nicholson, of you, but uh, I'll, I'll say something first. Um, yes. So, I mean, it was really interesting because there's a different couple, a couple different kinds of cases, one of which was actually just dismissed uh, at the beginning of the week that I need to read the UChicago um, Google one. Um, I'm happy to circulate the dismissal, but um, the UChicago one, Google one was slightly different in that UChicago had entered into an agreement with Google where they were supposed to have shared de-identified data sets, sort of like Professor Price was saying to us, once the data are de-identified, you really can do almost anything. And the claim in that case was that the data set had not been correctly de-identified. So that was slightly different. Um, some of the other cases um, with Mayo um, and Ascension Health, 
were somewhat more legally interesting because they were cases where the entity had entered into a business associate agreement with Google to conduct further analyses of the data. And this is allowable under HIPAA, although when HIPAA, when the HIPAA privacy rule was being drafted, no one was seeing the business associate being something like Google. Um, they were seeing it more like, you know, the, 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 the organization in Ann Arbor that helps us log into our me electronic medical records safely, right? Like that's the more traditional concept of a business associate. And I think the real difference is going to be between like a regular big business associate and this other kind of business associate that we will need to conceive of is whether the business associate walks away with something of value in addition to the amount they were paid to do the analysis, right? So in the Ascension and Mayo cases, Google is walking away with improved instruments for AI, um, whether or not they keep the data, they can give the data back, but they have something of value in exchange. And I think, I don't know exactly what the right solution is, but I think it will be tied to that and is not currently baked into the regulation. Great, thank you. Any of our other panelists wanna respond? Or I should say either. Um, I was just at a different person, not different perspective, but something that I think is important here. And it's about what do we do with data anyway? Um, and that the, you know, anybody who reads the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks and people tell you how horrible it is. And then as somebody who works in this space and you have to say, and it's still legal, um, is really kind of shocking to folks. And I think some of that is we are not good about telling people what we do with their data, what we can do to benefit everybody with their data and just being explicit about that. Um, so, you know, I think there, we could be doing a lot more. And so I'm not taking an opinion on any of these cases um, and I've had my head buried in other things, um, but really just, where people end up being very surprised and upset. It's partly because as researchers, we've not, or the research enterprise, we've not spoken to people and that there are exceptions in part because we don't sort of want to engage. And I think, you know, Kate found that in, in or, or, or the research assistant found it in talking to participants, right? They're, they're shocked and surprised. And yet, if you really can describe the benefits um, they may feel differently, or then we can negotiate better what those what those parameters are. Um, and I think that that's an important component that we need to address more directly. Great. Thank yeah, you. I just want to want to say I, I, I again completely agree with uh, <laughs> with uh, my co panelists here. Uh, it's I, I was on a panel with Professor Specter uh, when someone was mentioning the Ascension Google deal. And the answer was, yeah, this is totally legal under HIPAA. Um, and yet people get upset. Uh, and I think Professor Wolf's point is just right on. There is a bargain going on here, which is to say, there's a lot of use of data. And the point of the use of data, or at least a big point of the use of data is to make medical care better. And that to me seems like a great bargain but we only, to the extent that we hear about it as patients, as data subjects, as data generators, there's, I think, much more emphasis on the negative side of things um, than on the positive side of things, to the extent that this is something that comes up at all. It's much more, here are the privacy concerns and the risks and not, here's how medical care has really improved a lot. Uh, it's possible that my view of that is wrong because I just don't travel in uh, uh, because the people that I talk to are all, a lot of privacy people. Um, but uh, I think it's, we're doing a bad job of kind of selling what the grand bargain is. I should also mention it's hard to say that it's a good grand bargain when access to the tools that result from this kind of research is so wildly inequitable. Right. 
seems like a really important point too about the expectations of the patient slash consumers, however you want to frame them. That uh, we ha It's almost like I think of this distinction on our faculty between adjuncts and uh, tenure track faculty where there are significant differences internally, but to our students, they just see faculty. They just see someone in front of them teaching and all the you know tenure requirements and all the different uh, hours, service, all these things are very different on our end, but to their end, it's like, it's, this is my professor. And I, I see that as being somewhat similar to the idea of a patient who doesn't necessarily see a huge difference between a private sponsor of research that is connected in some tangential way with an academic facility uh, compared to their doctor or compared to the, the, the even the distinction between clinical and research or academic and uh, private. There's a lot of weight on that, as Professor Spector mentioned, but that's not always something obvious to the kind of consumer. And um, so just communicating that trust seems, communicating to build more trust seems so important. Uh, we'll go back to the questions now. There's a question about trade secrets for Professor Price, I believe, but if others want to weigh in, that would be great. Would any of you suggest changes in trade secret law as a way of addressing issues such as the advantage Myriad got in knowledge of genetic variants from years of their BRCA patents? The court case only addressed patent rights and what might those changes to trade secret be? Yeah, um, I, I'm in favor of disclosure, but I think I come at it from a different direction than trade secret law, which is to say, rather than saying um, trade secret law should treat these sorts of data differently, uh, I think it's more important to say we should have avenues for active disclosure of data. Um, so disclosure via FDA, for instance, um, or via whoever else could potentially collect and share data through NIH or, or whatever. The reason I say that I think that trade secrecy isn't the way to go here is because trade secrecy is to some extent just a legal writer on, ac ac uh, sorry, on actual secrecy, um, which is to say like, look, if Myriad keeps all its stuff in a database that no one else can have access to, trade secrecy only matters if someone steals part of that database or a disgruntled employee takes it with them and contract can stop the latter one and the former one, like, okay, but it just means if we don't have trade secrecy law that's gonna protect that, it just means Myriad's gonna put a tighter lock on its database. Uh, and so trade secrecy law is, is an avenue of intervention, but one which I think is ultimately subordinate to the reality of keeping things actually secret. And so if we want is data that are more disclosed, which I tend to want, uh, we're gonna need to do something uh, more active uh, than just change the legal protection of trade secrecy. Great, thank you. Any remarks from our other panelists? No? Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I think we have another question now for Professor Wolf. Uh, you mentioned the practice of sending requesters to the medical record when research data is present there. Given the heartburn this gives many in-house legal counsel for academic medical centers, do you see any pathways to get some regulatory clarity on this practice? So sort of going back to where uh, Professor Spector said, the likelihood of getting clarity, you know, we've been through uh, changes in 2016 that, you know, these things don't come up very often. Um, in terms of how the council were using it, I, you know, and I'm, I'm hearing sort of a different perspective on it than what we heard. Um, it was sort of before the, the experience, uh, the practice became more common of putting research data into it. It really was just that, oh, you want that information. Yes, we have it, or they wouldn't actually acknowledge it, but it may be in the research, but it's also in the medical record. So let's just take an easier path to that. Um, and so I'm not sure, not having spoken to counsel recently, whether they're even thinking about doing that now, given the, the intermingling, um, because that does create the problem that they were trying to avoid in the first place. And when I say that, why they would pass people off to the medical record is we heard a lot of the people who um, did not wanna be the one who ruined certificates protections by having lost that case. Um, so right. that was sort of the rationale for passing it along. And even when they were um, defending something, a lot of times they would rely on some other legal doctrine rather than the certificate um, you know, for somebody in California, the fact that privacy is a constitutional right that made it a very strong 
first, we'll go with that. And certificate might be the fifth argument that we're bringing forward. Right. That's very interesting. So it looks like we are now out of time. I want to thank our panelists for just a terrific discussion. In so many ways, your remarks were complimentary with one another. It was just really terrific. So just wanna um, remind the uh, guests that next week we have the second uh, 2.0 version of the Larvy Symposium, uh, um, a little bit longer of a day, but we had such a wonderful turnout today. So thank you for joining us and thank you to, my, to our panelists for uh, such excellent comments. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This was terrific. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.